I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are crucial to our success. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to my colleague in the RLP, Shayla Weber, uh, who will kick things off for us. Hi, good morning, everyone. Or good morning from, from the West Coast of the US. Uh, I'm Shayla Scott Weber. I am a senior program officer here with the Research Library Partnership, uh, where I focus on uh, programming and research and outreach for the, um, the archives and special collections community. I'm going to do a very brief introduction today, and then we'll get to our, our presenters. Um, so those of you who've come to our webinars before have probably heard me say that we have a long um, history of working in archives, special and distinctive collections. And, um, and we do that because we know how much work and effort and investment goes into caring for and stewarding these collections, um, and that they're an important site of, of um, knowledge creation in the research library. Uh, one of the the challenges of archives and special collections can be um, dealing with the, their uniqueness and dealing with them at scale. And and one of the uh, major tools of that I think in our conversation in the last decade or so around dealing with collections of scale at scale has been um, collection assessments and collection surveys. Uh, I'm highlighting here our, our own report from back in 2011 on uh, archival collections assessment. Um, that I think is still very relevant and useful today if you're, if you are planning such a thing. Um, and there has been a fair bit of conversation in the literature about, uh, planning and implementing archival assessment projects, but not as much conversation about what happens afterwards. Um, what, uh, what works, what doesn't work, what data is useful, what data is less useful, and, and how, um, on how you take all of that investment in a project like that and, and, and act on it. So, I'm really excited uh, that our colleagues from NYU are here today. Um, I'm personally excited because this was a project I was involved in the early days of, um, but I am I'm excited for all of us to be here together to uh, to learn from them. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to them. Thanks so much. Hi, Weatherly. If you're speaking, you're muted. Um, I'm not speaking, but can you pass me the ball? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this morning. Um, we are excited to present with you. So um, we'd like to begin by introducing ourselves. Uh, here we are. We work in different, though, allied departments at New York University Libraries. My name is Weatherly Steven. I'm the head of archival collections management, and I oversee archival accessioning and arrangement and description work for the special collections, as well as archival systems administration. Good morning. I'm Shannon O'Neill, curator for the Tamman and Wagner collections. In this role, I'm responsible for collection development, public programming, exhibition and instruction, and supporting research within the collections. And good morning, everyone. I am Kim Tarr, the head of the Media Preservation Unit, and I'm responsible for developing our media preservation policies, guiding our activities, and overseeing the Media Preservation Labs at NYU's Division of Libraries. So um, first, we'll give you a quick overview of what we'll be discussing today. We'll give some background on the collection assessment project at NYU, which was completed last year. And we'll each spend some time giving our individual perspectives on the outcomes of this project as an archivist, a curator, and a preservationist. We'll end by briefly looking at our next steps in the years to come with the data we collected. What we officially titled the Collections Control Project, or affectionately abbreviated as CCP, ran at NYU Libraries from January 2017 to January 2020. Starting a full year beforehand, my department, ACM, underwent detailed planning and preparations, which ranged from implementing archive space 
to the nuts and bolts of designing and estimating the project phases. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the staff who executed this project, without whom we would have no road ahead. Um, these folks gave years of their labor and expertise to the CCP, and they remained flexible and committed in the face of many challenges. They are student assistants Abby Oster, Michael German, Marissa Grossman, Ahmed Hafezi, Sandra Lolik, and Kristen Joy Owens, and archivists Sharon Kaki, Jasmine Larkin, Jennifer Neal, Jackie Ryder, Craig Sabino, and Corso. We thank you all. In talking about the project origins, I would also like to recognize the work of Chayla Scott Weber, one of our OCLC hosts today, who previously served as the inaugural head of Archival Collections Management. This project was Chayla's passion, and she advocated for its funding and prioritization for years before we began planning in earnest. Thank you, Chayla. The result of Chayla's advocacy was an internal commitment in the libraries to support the project through accrual of money or salary savings for three years. This project was one major piece of several implemented to support the consolidation of three archival repositories at NYU, the Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives, the Fales Library and Special Collections, and the New York University Archives, which were reorganized into a single department in 2019. The goals of this reorganization were to foster more holistic collaboration and planning across these three repositories, and the approval of the project by the previous dean and senior leadership signaled the recognition of the necessity of having better control of the collections to meet these goals. Here is a very brief overview of the project phases, and I'll tell you about the deliverables. So our project had four phases, each of which ran with some concurrence across the three repositories. In the administrative data survey, archivists reviewed over 2,000 collection files and recorded consistent acquisition, rights, and access information for every collection into archive space. The deliverable was a complete list of collections without contracts or deeds documenting our ownership. During the shelf read, archivists barcoded and recorded the shelf location in archive space for containers sitting on 13,000 linear feet of shelves across three floors of the library. The results were our ability to produce comprehensive shelf lists for the first time and calculate an accurate extent of the collections. For collection assessment, using Qualtrics, which is survey software that collects structured data, we surveyed on-site collections totaling 20,000 boxes using an enhanced PACSCOL survey instrument that included additional ratings, carrier count, and capacity for all audiovisual and born digital media. Since we've assessed new accessions and newly processed collections both before and after the CCP, we've recorded over 2,800 assessments in Qualtrics. And to give you a sense of the size of actual survey design, it exports to a 385 column spreadsheet, which is quite large. Offsite processing involves stabilizing processed collections to go offsite or processing collections at a very high level of arrangement work to move as much material off-site as possible. We were concerned about um, making space on site for construction and keeping pace with acquisitions. And we were successful in those aims, sending around 70, sorry, 7,000 linear feet of materials to our off-site storage facility over three years. While we'll talk primarily about results of the assessment portion, it's important to note that assessment built on many other activities, and we would not have nearly as complete of a picture of the collections without the other project phases. So now we're each going to talk about how the data collected um, is being used in our areas and what we've learned from working with it. I'm starting with my perspective as an archivist doing collections management work. When working with the assessment data, I am primarily focused on the state of our collections. This can't be understated, but before this project, we could not generate a complete list of our archival holdings from archive space, which is our system of record. Not until last year did we actually know exactly what we're managing, all the forms, the materials take, and have it all living in archive space. We had a vague idea, but nothing specific or quantified about the backlog of inaccessible, and undescribed collections. And that was a good as, re as good of a reason as any to take on the project. This isn't assessment data per se, but I wanna mention it because it's the foundation of what I built with assessment data 
which was for the first time a full quantification of our archival collections backlog for these three repositories. My first step with the completion of the project was to look at all the data collectively to see what naturally stood out. So if you're not familiar with the PAC school survey instrument, it ranks different characteristics of a collection on a five point Likert scale. I'm highlighting three characteristics here on this slide. Moving clockwise, our quality of housing, quality of description, and then physical accessibility or arrangement. In each bar chart, these ratings go uh, top to bottom, one through five, with one being the lowest and five the highest rating. Our numbers on the quality of housing are actually uh, pretty manageable to me, likely because archivists rehoused materials as needed throughout the shelf read that immediately preceded the assessment. And oddly, our physical access or arrangement numbers aren't nearly as bad as the intellectual access or the quality of description. We'd always had an anecdotal perception that the collections were physically very messy and in poor condition. And while some are, this data actually showed that we needed to be a lot more concerned with the state of our description and when processing, concentrate heavily on descriptive data rather than detailed arrangement work. To speak to uh, the physical condition and housing needs, I met with conservators and we found a first instance where our methodology could have been better refined. It made sense to narrow our focus to anything rated one or two in these categories as they're the lowest ratings. Um, they applied to 140 collections total and conservators wanted to assess further. But we'd often recorded multiple assessments for a collection sometimes for accretions or just portions if it was split up among buildings at NYU. So we couldn't just look at individual responses, but needed to aggregate all responses for a collection that scored a one or two in order to get a truer sense of what was going on with that particular collection. In addition, if remediation work was already done, we realized it would have made it a lot easier on our future selves to update the data or mark previously low ratings as no longer current but we hadn't built a way of doing this into the Qualtrics survey before we started analysis. This issue doesn't only apply to preservation-related ratings, but it was the first place at which conservators and I realized uh, we'd have to use this data as a starting point more than a punch list. I'm gonna focus into the description rating now. Um, as I said, it's our weakest criterion, and description is also work that my department can take action on, and it directly correlates to the backlog. Within quality of description, around 1,600 collections or over half of all collections by count have good to excellent description, which are the four and five ratings. But another 1,224, the one through three ratings, have description that is either not compliant with contemporary data standards, not online, or not existent. I'm especially concerned about the ones and twos which are 30% of the assessed collections by count and broadly have no description online or just none at all. The same concern we had about the data for conservation needs applies here. We needed to aggregate multiple responses for single collections. However, even after aggregation, percentages of collections by count aren't terribly meaningful when we're talking about processing needs and planning. I tried in a few different ways to make this data tell a different story than it could before I realized that um, what I needed to do was use it as a springboard for what I actually wanted, which was extents. Um, since we have both the assessment data and a new ability to produce a complete list of our holdings, I had two puzzle pieces for a deeper backlog analysis. This did require additional review of archive space records, and um, my entire department pitched in on this after a tele or as a telework project um, at the start of the pandemic. It bore out my concern that representing collections by count in the backlog may not give us the most accurate picture of what we're up against, as you can see with the variance between collections by count and extent. It got me a lot closer to something that feels actionable, which is a list of all collections in Airtable, which is our project management system, with the linear footage extent of unprocessed portions uh, or complete collections, very preliminary item counts of unprocessed audiovisual media, and estimates of unprocessed born digital records in terabytes. ACM has always collected and maintained robust annual statistics on accessioning and processing, but quantifying the backlog actually contextualizes those statistics in a meaningful way 
especially for formats like Born Digital. We've processed between two and three terabytes a year um, for several years, and that's been a huge undertaking for our staff. But it's minuscule when it's compared to the extent acquired and in the backlog, and we will have to be strategic about rebalancing those resources in the future. I also remixed the linear footage extent of the backlog in a few different ways. Um, for a report I circulated to leadership in the library, I translated the backlog in terms of our current processing resources and preservation capacity. Processing at a high average yearly rate of 400 linear feet a year, this backlog would require 35 full-time equivalent years of processing archivists to eliminate. Nine collections, each of which measure between 175 to 400 linear feet, make up 17% of the backlog. Um, another 4,850 linear feet, which belong to 517 collections, or 35% of the backlog, consist of accretion or accretions or unprocessed portions of processed collections. Um, and we've typically found that these can be arranged and described quickly, barring any major access or preservation issues. And then lastly, 15% of the backlog comes from collections that individually measure less than 10 linear feet, which is easily a week's worth of work or less for a processing archivist. These were a few different ways of diving into what would otherwise seem like an insurmountable backlog. And it's allowed us to start having conversations about where to begin or how to approach the mix of the size of these collections rather than to just feel stymied. While the backlog, backlog report that I just described is more of a communication tool, the Airtable base will likely remain the primary tracking tool. And we can easily add or subtract extents as assignments are completed, which I know this is a small uh, screenshot, but the green column in the center is the extents. The Airtable base is also the foundation of uh, conversations with curators. Having both assessment data and the backlog list has allowed me and the curators to shift prioritization conversations to better align with reality. To our quarterly meetings, each curator brings a short list of collections they'd like to have open, and I provide time estimates so that we can all adjust expectations of what can feasibly be accomplished. Right now, we are working year by year uh, with the goal of having all 1,133 backlog collections ranked num numerically, which is also stored um, in this sheet. This will allow us to be transparent about what is not accessible and what is prioritized, uh, where there was absolutely no, no transparency about this before. One final thing I'll mention is that I see a need to evolve both our survey instrument and the actual system we used for assessment now that I've worked with this data for about a year. I think we need to move away from Qualtrics to a more lightweight system, even if that gives us less sophisticated logic in the survey itself. With Qualtrics, we created a form that privileges ease of use for staff when completing assessments. But that design yields a cumbersome data set when extracted, and we were thinking about how to separate the complex functions that count media in the Qualtrics survey into a system called Media Log, which is a locally developed tool that we have to inventory and track preservation work on physical digital media. This would simplify the actual assessment data we collect quite a bit. The more data we add to Qualtrics, the more difficult it becomes to go in and look at individual responses, update them, and then allow curators and the preservation department staff to apply their own filters. Well, I think we imagined in planning, wanting to compare old and new survey responses as materials are processed. What we can see from the quality of housing ratings is that almost unilaterally, we're improving collections simply by turning our attention to them. And we want a more nimble way of sifting out the materials that deserve our attention. I also don't imagine having the time or resources to compare assessments of any but the largest or more complex collections pre and post processing, and we can probably document that in other ways. As for the data itself, I really only used it as a jumping off point for different analyses and views. There's no getting around the fact that collecting a large amount of data is only part of what we did. We also needed to work with it to make it mean anything. And for the kind of tracking I want to do on improving our collections physically and descriptively, tracking in a way that is meaningful to the sometimes poor state of these collections 
a five-point Likert scale may be conducive to overly subjective assessments. For example, um, when assessing conservation needs that only exist in a small percentage of the collection, major issues can get lost in the average or negatively skew the assessment of an otherwise physically stable collection. Rather than go more granular, I'm aiming to align our assessment data more with our three processing levels, continue to keep track of unprocessed extents and processing priorities in Airtable, so it's together in one place that curators can access, and then develop more meaningful data points about physical condition in collaboration with the conservation lab. So now I am uh, turning over to Shannon. Hi, everyone. To briefly reintroduce myself, I'm Shannon O'Neill, um, and the Taminant Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives documents the histories and ongoing experiences of political and social movements, the left, labor organizing, immigration, and migration. As a curator, um, I work in collaboration and conversation with documentarians, oral historians, activists, researchers, scholars, and artists to imagine the shape and nature of the Tamament Wagner collections and their use. I very much recognize that my curatorial decisions have reverberating impacts. I see this impact institutionally with regard to our labor and resource capacities. A decision on my part to acquire a large and unwieldy collection is a choice that echoes in our budget for supplies, long-term storage, and FTE, FTE hours for collections management, processing, and preservation. I feel incredibly lucky to work with a collection for which there is deep investment from donors, creators, researchers, and other interested parties. From the perspective of community connections, my curatorial decisions must resonate with the community's needs. And I understand that my work ultimately has effects upon trust, communication, and partnerships with our current community and the ways in which this community may grow. So by no means a replacement for doing the integral work to honor a community's agency and authority over its own histories, our assessment data is, in some ways, a document of curatorial impact. And grappling with this data has offered me insights into understanding the collection. Our assessment data has opened a window onto past decision making, how those decisions affect my current approaches to our collections and the ways that I might move forward in tandem with our community of record creators and um, researchers. I've been at, uh, a part of NYU Special Collections for about a year and a half. While I'm considerably more acquainted with my colleagues, the collections, and our workflows now than I was in August of 2019, I'm still relatively new to my job. And in a lot of ways, my colleagues are also new to their jobs. NYU Special Collections, as Weatherly noted, is a recently formed department established shortly before I joined the organization. With the consolidation of the three repositories, University Archives, Sales, and Tamament into a single department, we now share a budget, space, and have unified policies. This has made understanding the collections all that more imperative, not only so that I can best advocate for, be, be, be a good advocate for adequate resources for the Tamament, but also so that I can understand the ways in which our three repositories speak to one another. Coupled with being new to my uh, role, we have collectively experienced the effects of living during a global pandemic for almost a year now. I have at this point spent more time working remotely than I have worked on site. NYU is incredibly privileged in that we participate in a regular testing regime and many of my colleagues are able to work remotely full time. The conditions of our workplace have made it relatively safe for me to return to work, albeit in the interest of keeping building density low, only part-time. The collections assessment data has been something of a lifeline to the collections during this period, allowing me to continue to make observations and garner, garner insights from the collection, even at a distance. My approach to curation is through a framework of radical empathy and critical care work both of which require deep listening and noticing. As activist, author, and doula Adrian Marie Brown reminds us, what you pay attention to grows. As I noted, data cannot be a replacement for doing the hard work to understand and support a community's needs. This does not, however, negate the fact that access to this data has allowed me to see the Tamament records holistically, to have a kind of bird's eye view of the collection. 
In addition to direct dialogue with the Tamamint's community, the collection assessment guides me to where I need to pay closer attention, inviting me to ask more clearly, where have we been investing work? And conversely, where has our attention been lacking? In this way, I can more effectively imagine how to foster equitable distribution of our resources. Though the assessment data that we have does not definitively answer every question about our collections, rather than swimming in a sea of unknowns, with our data, I can begin to understand the complexity of our backlog. I can visualize its size and scope. I can pinpoint areas of the collection that necessitate prioritization, and I can identify preservation needs inclusive of where in the collection particularly vulnerable, vulnerable formats exist. As Weatherly noted, we did not really know the full extent of our backlog until the completion of the collections control project. The curators within NYU Special Collections meet with Weatherly on a quarterly basis to set, confirm, and adjust our annual processing priorities. It's difficult to determine priorities without an understanding of one's collections. This becomes profoundly more challenging when you're new to a collection, when the collection is large, when the collection must be responsive to numerous communities, and when you're working at a distance from that collection. All four of these realities are true with regard to my current work at the Tamament. In the early summer of 2020, Weatherly offered me an export of the Collection Controls Qualtrics survey, which we are viewing here. The original data output is really quite overwhelming and on older devices can take several minutes to open. I limited the export data to view only the entirety of the Tamament backlog and adjusted some of the data points to include those criteria which I felt would most impact my decision making with the collection. With a list of unprocessed collections now available to me, I created my own list which we are looking at together here. Collections are grouped by call number in order and include specific CCP assessment data. This list notes sizes of the unprocessed collections, their legal status in terms of whether or not a formal title has been transferred to NYU, if they scored a three or below on the CCP's preservation scale, and if the collection contains born digital or audiovisual records. I've added to this data a column for whether or not minimal work is required. This column indicates when a collection is in relatively healthy shape and has a nearly complete record in archive space. Our ultimate goal is to create a completely prioritized backlog. This list will inform that process in the following ways. Collections without deeds will move to the bottom of the list as it does not behoove us to process a collection for which we do not have a full understanding of its terms of access rights or ownership. Collections with low preservation scores will move to the top of the prioritization list, as will collections that contain vulnerable formats, in particular AV. I'd like to have a more in-depth conversation about the collections that are classed as minimal work needed. For example, is it more strategic for us to push these collections to the top of the queue and process them quickly, or is it better to pepper these collections throughout the queue to provide moments of easily achievable work amongst more difficult and longer projects? Utilizing the list, I can also identify collections that I anticipate will be high use. For example, our Communist, our Communist Party papers are a widely accessed collection. I can prioritize collections associated with the CP's history knowing that they will likely be of distinct interest to our scholarly community and have a significant impact on their research. Donor and community relationships are also important to address as a part of this prioritization work. Within the Tamament collection, there are a few key collecting scopes that are representative of larger communities of stakeholders. Looking at the backlog list, I can envision or anticipate how each of these communities' histories can be equitably addressed within the overall prioritization ranking for processing. As much as the work of the curator is to look forward, it necessarily also requires looking back. From the backlog data alone, and often in the absence of documentation about previous acquisitions decisions, I can understand what areas of the collection were emphasized and what resources those collections necessitate going forward. I am then able to effectively communicate these needs to my colleagues as we work together to, determ to determine a fully, pri fully prioritized backlog of our collection. So where does this data take me going forward? For one, the assessment data deeply impacts my appraisal and retro retrospective appraisal decisions. 
looking at collection extents, I might narrow in on particularly large collections and physically review them. Do they, for example, contain significant duplicate materials or include published materials that are elsewhere in our holdings? These types of collections may present themselves as excellent candidates for reappraisal or possible deaccessioning. I know both anecdotally and through my personal experience of the collections that the Tamament collections overly privilege the narratives of white men in social and political movements. One of our goals, um, collective goals, amongst the curators and special collections is to prioritize documentation of marginalized histories. While the assessment data in and of itself is not a useful indicator for whether or not a collection contains documentation of marginalized communities, the assessment data does encourage me to become further acquainted with the collection, such that these histories that have been languishing in our backlog can be both surfaced and given greater attention and care. As I've already shared, the assessment data is informative towards future collections development, Looking at the assessment data and our backlog, I have a greater sense of where we have committed ourselves, where our collection strengths lie, and what aspects of the collection necessitate more attention and further conversations with our various communities. This ultimately has a deep influence on our plans for setting processing and preservation priorities. Lastly, with the assessment data, I'm a more effective advocate for the collections. I'm better situated to pitch funding proposals to our development office and I'm better poised to anticipate grant opportunities. Now, Kim Tarr will share about how the assessment data has impacted her work in AV preservation. Great, thanks so much, Shannon. Um, hello, everyone. As <clears throat> noted at the top of the hour, I'm Kimberly Tarr, and I oversee the Media Preservation Program at NYU Libraries. This is a role I've held for just over eight years. So, I've been a part of the Division of Library Staff a tad longer than my two colleagues today, um, and I found the data that came from this project quite illuminating in ways that I'll um, dive into shortly. For the talk today, I will be lending a preservation perspective to this conversation. Specifically, I'll out outline the benefit of this data in considering the long-term care of archival audiovisual materials. A key data point collected during the collections control project, as Weatherly outlined, was carrier or format count, the final counts of which presented both a confirmation of what we had assumed and also shined a light on some audiovisual materials within archival collections that we were not aware of. Before diving in, however, I thought it would be beneficial to outline a brief history and impetus for the creation of the Media Preservation Unit. So, a bit of background. The program was initiated in 2005 with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. NYU Libraries worked closely with the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Graduate Program at NYU to develop a film inspection and magnetic media reformatting unit. Now, more than 15 years later, the mature and robust Media Preservation Program within the Division of Libraries allows us to care for a wide array of motion picture film, analog and digital audio, as well as analog and digital video formats. To paint a picture of our physical spaces, um, of which you see an image of here of our video lab, uh, we actually maintain two video labs, two audio labs, and a motion picture film scanner. Our conservation colleagues who care for book, paper, photographs, and objects occupy the labs adjacent to ours, which allows for communication and collaboration. The Media Preservation Unit includes four full-time staff members, including myself, and in our pre-COVID operations, also included two to three graduate students each semester. These physical spaces, which are outfitted with a wide array of playback equipment, and this essential core staffing allow us to create preservation masters and digital survey surrogates. Um, prior to the launch of the Collections Control Project, the Preservation Department was invited to provide feedback on the survey instrument when it was in development. We seized that opportunity to offer some foundational support on format identification and discuss best practices for both handling as well as long-term care of film, video, and audio formats. There are an array of resources 
resources available online that can support the identification of audiovisual formats. One of the more comprehensive is uh, listed here on the slide. It's the University of Illinois Preservation Self-Assessment Program, effective, uh, affectionately known as PSAP. Um, and the authors describe that as, quote, a free online tool <coughs> excuse me, that helps collection managers prioritize efforts to improve conditions of collections. With this tool, I appreciate the multiple images of each format, the physical descriptions, and the concise format summaries. Another great option is the Texas Commission on the Arts Video Handbook, which although it was published many years ago now, it is the single best photo reference for video in my estimation. Once underway, we realized that additional support could be beneficial to ensure that CCP archivists had a stronger foundation in the identification of audiovisual formats, which can be admittedly quite confusing as many formats look quite similar. Once the data collection began in earnest, I realized that there was both an opportunity for educating archive staff that suddenly found themselves needing to swiftly identify the difference between, say, a Betacam tape and a Betamax videotape. We offered uh, an in-person training for archivists, care and handling of special collections materials um, at which this, this photo here was taken. <clears throat> Admittedly, I think that it may have been beneficial to have conducted this training earlier in the project, but that is certainly a lesson learned as we were balancing a large-scale renovation-related collections move around the same time. Appropriate housing for audiovisual materials can be complicated. Over the course of the CCP, the Preservation Department would often answer questions about suitable housing, and if available, we would provide replacements for housing that was missing, unsupportive, broken, or torn. For example, when loose 16 millimeter celluloid films were located in collection storage with no housing, just loose in a box, we could advise that the film should be taped down with paper tape and placed in an archival uh, vented inert polypropylene can. Because we stock these materials in our department, we could support these efforts as needed. <coughs> Excuse me. Or advise on appropriate supplies to purchase. Undoubtedly, there were issues that would arise. General questions such as, what is this? Or more pointed questions such as, could this be mold? And answers to those questions, yes, this is a quarter inch open reel audio tape and it is in fact mold on the tape pack. Some films were uncovered in what had been a temporary non-print collection in Tamament. These films suffered from advanced acid deterioration, which is colloquially known as vinegar syndrome. Um, so we arranged to have these films relocated to our lab so that we could conduct both additional condition assessments as well as provide some content information as they, there was really limited or no description on these reels. Over the course of this period, I realized the difficulty in uniform, uniformly applying the five-point rating scale for housing. During idle conversations, my staff, who collectively have decades of audiovisual training, often had conflicting ideas on what to assign a particular item. So I imagine how difficult it would be for multiple CCP archivists to ensure their ratings were consistent over a multi-year project, particularly when each box could only receive a, a few seconds or a few minutes of attention. Because we treat special collections materials in our media labs each day, we are familiar with the majority of formats in the collections. Therefore, it didn't come as a huge surprise to learn that 15% of all audiovisual formats identified in the survey were VHS video cassettes. Introduced in the late 1970s, this half-inch analog cassette-based video format was ubiquitous throughout the 80s and 90s and was accessible to consumers and presented few obstacles for use. We see VHS tapes in our lab almost daily. Similarly, compact audio cassettes accounted for 38% of all audiovisual materials in the collections. Um, again, similar years of use and limited barriers to access 
So that makes sense. There were some surprises, however, that I will delve into, but first a high level look at what we learned. We now possess granular data on motion picture film, video, and audio, and we can review those numbers by collection with the additional data on stock lengths and real size, which would be essential for calculating transfer time, staffing resources required, and digital storage estimates. I, I took the very granular data and amassed it into this bird's eye look at the findings represented in this colorful pie chart in front of us, in which we see that audio accounts for the largest segment of AV holdings at 59%. <clears throat> Video is a second at 28%, and then followed by film, motion picture uh, film. Other AV was a bit of a nebulous category and um, required me to drill down a bit into the data. And I realized that this is primarily optical discs, so DVDs, CDs, as well as some other um, formats, including XD cam. Unfortunately, I think that this category may have been used when there was any uncertainty. So Weatherly and I have spoken already about going back to adjust some of this data. I imagine that 9% that that 9% other will then go down as we appropriately assign those materials into their correct existing categories. The chart I've included here, and forgive me if the numbers are small, I wanted to fit all of this information, but no, it's quite tiny, includes the data by format, including item counts as well as percentages. There are per there's a percentage by media type as well as a percentage of total AV. So for example, if we look together at eight millimeter film, which is the first row on the list, we see that there are 594 items which of all film accounts for 19% of the films. Or if we look at all AV, it's about 1% um, of all AV. So there are some points of concern that require further exploration um, and clarification. We see data here that also backs up trends we've observed in the lab. So in 2017, we um, had just kind of been observing how micro cassettes had been coming into our labs for uh, curators had prioritized them for reformatting. So we uh, outfitted our audio lab uh, with that format to be able to handle that, cap that format capability. Similarly, we observed that video 8 and hi 8 format has been sent for digitization um, and it seems like there are many more tapes to follow. So that, that bears out, that, that makes sense. There are some points of concern that require further exploration and clarification. For example, I highlighted in yellow some rows that puzzled me over the course of my review. Digital compact cassette is highlighted here because I fear that category may have been used erroneously instead of the one below, which is compact cassette, an analog format. If there are so many digital compact cassettes in the collections, um, I'm surprised because they've never come down to us. Um, and if this is in fact true, um, I need to dig in a little bit more um, and, and think through uh, why they haven't been prioritized for, for preservation and, and, and talk a little bit more with the archivists and curators. So um, the fact that all of the open real video formats came back with zero, Leads me to wonder whether these perhaps were classified elsewhere, as I do know that we have these highly vulnerable obsolete formats in the collections. As we consider what equipment our media preservation labs may require to digitize these formats, having this data is essential. We can consider whether it makes sense for us to seek out playback equipment on the secondary market and integrate it into our labs, or perhaps it makes to send specific formats to an external vendor. Having this data allows me to run those calculations to evaluate. So um, we want to end by just talking about where we're headed from here at a very high level, what we're doing next with this data. 
First, we're looking forward to better, stronger collaboration. The project itself, um, even without the data, highlighted for us all how our work is intertwined. CCP staff had questions every week, if not every day, for curatorial and preservation staff, and we were grateful for their time and patience. In our three departments, we all approach the collection slightly differently, but the data makes very clear where our work intersects, even if it all boils down to helping researchers get access to collections. As we're all chomping at the bit to take action on the collections that need work, we can sometimes unintentionally create work for each other. And we're more conscientious about communicating this and uh, scheduling projects at times when other departments have the bandwidth. Next, um, I have advocacy with meaningful data, and here I, I really mean advocating for permanent positions and structural resources. Um, we accomplished this project with contingent labor, and NYU has followed the national trend for years in staffing processing positions through soft money with terms. Having our holdings and the backlog quantified um, as well um, as a strong sense of our yearly capacity for processing helps paint a very different picture about the resources that we need to invest in processing if we're going to responsibly steward these collections. In particular, with a third of our materials not yet discoverable and 97% of our born digital, record, born digital records not preserved and in the backlog, we need to think very carefully about how and where to put our resources and make decisions about acquisitions and processing that are informed by our existing backlog holdings and processing capacity. These decisions can be data informed rather than anecdotal, and that allows us both structure because it's clear what we have and what we can do with what we have, as well as the flexibility to try things we haven't imagined before. So our assessment data also allows us to communicate um, about our work more clearly. And as an example, from time to time, we are approached by partner external to um, our department such as faculty or senior administrators about potential acquisition opportunities. And our assessment data gives us um, some perspectives on how we can respond. So we might, for example, respond affirmatively if the um, acquisition opportunity addresses an area of our collections that necessitate attention, or we might um, open up a further dialogue if the potential opportunity overlaps um, with collections that are already in our backlog and perhaps even ranked low in that prioritization queue. And as Weatherly um, has suggested, the work ahead of us is really resource intensive, um, which will really uh, necessitate us partnering with our development office to seek out um, funding opportunities. As Weatherly shared um, earlier in the webinar, our back in our backlog there are nine collections, each of which measure between 175 and 400 linear feet, and these nine collections alone make up 17% of our total backlog. So um, given the labor and time it would, process, it would take to process these, we really see these as excellent um, candidates for fundraising. So to that end, the assessment data really illuminates our work for our colleagues. It, let, it allows us to specifically name the collection's needs and this is really useful for communicating transparently with grant officers and donors. And lastly, now that we have this essential information at hand and we understand the labor and resources involved in stewardship, we are better equipped to emphasize the value of appraisal. We're advocating for appraisal and selection prior to acquisition so that we do not bring materials that we do not intend to keep for the long term. As such, curators, archivists, and preservation staff are all involved in this process. We now conduct site visits uh, prior to accessioning to assess potential condition issues before materials arrive at NYU. Through this collections control project process, we can now more clearly articulate that unilateral decision-making without understanding impact across units is problematic and instead encourage collaboration and communication. Um, I want to thank you so much for um, all joining us this morning. Should um, questions emerge for you following today's session, 
Weatherly, Shannon, and I would welcome your um, questions or communication at the email addresses listed here. Uh, but if you have immediate questions, I suppose what's uh, actually coming next now um, will be our, our carved out time for Q&A. So at this point, I'll transition over to Chayla. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, um, Kim and Shannon and Weatherly. That was terrific. Um, we do have a, a number of questions that have come in uh, over the uh, course of the presentation, so I'll jump into those. Um, a number of them I'm going to combine that are about Qualtrics and the survey tool. Um, so uh, um, can you talk about how long it took to design and test the Qualtrics survey tool? Um, I, this is Weatherly. I can answer that. Um, it was it was a, a definitely around six months of work um, from the start of assessing which tool we were going to use to actually having the Qualtrics tool built. Um, it it is a really complex survey, and it um, it required consultation with our NYU data services to assist um, actually building all the logic pieces in. Um, and then two other questions about that. Um, uh, Michelle Willens asks, what other collection survey assessment tools did you consider and why did you eventually decide on Qualtrics? And then um, Karen Sayers asks, did you look at the Columbia University Library's special collections material survey instrument when designing the Qualtrics? So, um, yes, that is something that is, it's very similar, kind of speaks to the Pax School survey instrument as well, the Columbia uh, survey. Um, I believe that one is a Microsoft Access, like the actual survey instrument itself is Microsoft Access. That was not going to be an option for us um, because right at the time we were implementing this project, um, the university was um, uh, removing support for networked access to databases, which is why we are very pro Airtable, actually. Um, we looked at using something like Google Forms or Google Sheets and um, our colleagues with more knowledge about, um, about data management in the library really convinced us to go in, a, in this robust direction with Qualtrics. And I mean, it bears mentioning that at the time there was no assessment module in archive space. And since then, that is a module that's been built out and something I'm considering is whether we want to merge our data into archive space. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Nina Schneider asks, how was this project funded? It was internally funded on soft money, so it wasn't a grant, um, but the library administration was willing to kind of earmark um, what, are, what are called salary savings. So um, the money saved from positions being vacant um, for us to use. Great, thanks. Um, and Audra, you uh, at UC Irvine asks, uh, can you talk about the process of training students and or new staff on your assessment tools and methods? What what skills are useful for archivals, archival workers to have in this context? Um, this is Weatherly again. Uh, I, I think the biggest skill to emphasize is decision making and um, knowing either where you have the ability to kind of make a decision based on your professional judgment or you need to escalate it to someone else. Um, for students, we had really discrete, well-defined tasks that they were assigned. Um, you know, so within the assessment, they did a lot of the counting um, once um, media types were identified. They did a lot of the, the rehousing work after rehousing needs were identified. Um, but we had a lot of kind of small decision trees of like, you know, if a if a box has a broken handle, if you open a box and the inside is acidified, you know, points at which we absolutely wanted an intervention. And then there was some gray area where like an archivist needed to be the person kind of intervening between a student assistant and say a preservation staff member or um, a manager like myself who who may need to make decisions. Great, thank you. Um, and a, a question about rehousing. Why uh, why did you decide to rehouse during the shelf read stage prior to implementing the survey? Uh, what was your timeline for ordering or producing new housing? 
Weatherly again. Um, I think the decision was just kind of a, an artifact of what we were actually hoping to accomplish with the shelf read, which was not just recording the locations of every box, but making sure they were accurately and properly labeled as well as um, barcoded. And like I said, some boxes were broken or acidified, um, and it, it made sense just at that time to replace them and take a couple of minutes so that we weren't putting a label on a box or a barcode on a box that was going to be replaced. It just was a time-saving measure. Um, everything that we replaced was, was a, a very typically um, stocked box that we keep on hand. Anything that was more specialized had to be um, prioritized with the conservation lab. Um, and that was a much lengthier process of really talking about what priorities were at the time and what could live kind of as good enough until they had more um, bandwidth to take on complex rehousing. Thanks. Um, Shannon, I think this, these are probably for you. Um, Marilee Prophet asks, if a collection doesn't have a deed, how does that am impact decisions about prioritization? And then there's a second deed question from Audra. Related to Marilee's question, who is or will be responsible for deed work for collections missing a deed of gift? Might it also be possible that collections of high potential research interest and or documenting marginalized communities could be missing their deed? Thank you. Yeah, these are really important questions. And um, I'd like to start with addressing the point about um, collections of high potential research interest or documenting marginalized communities missing their deeds. Um, this is a big concern for me. Um, I think often about, you know, deeds are um, a, a culmination point of, of sorts for um, relationships that have been built over long periods of time. So I'm seeing um, these missing deeds as an opportunity to be able to maybe reestablish relationships that have um, lapsed or um, just reconnect with community members. Um, and in terms of affecting prioritization, I'm imagining the collections without deeds um, almost moving into a separate workflow for me, um, wherein I will do the work to see if I can um, find the creator or the donor of the collection or their next of kin who might be able to um, complete paperwork with us and or if they at that point in time request to have the materials returned to the accession, the collection, and return um, that material back to them. Um, and then it, in the more complicated scenario where um, it's difficult to um, associate a, co a collection with an individual or an, or, or an organization in order to get the deed signed, um, I'm imagining um, needing to involve our uh, general counsel and thinking um, more through uh, uh, processes of, I guess, what would be like um, uh, claiming un like unclaimed property, um, but I still haven't yet fully figured out what that what that scenario uh, looks like in the workflow. Um, but thank you for these questions. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Um, Amber, I'm sorry that we didn't get to your last question. Maybe you can email Kim. Um, and I just want to thank you all again for being here today. Thank you so much to our presenters. Thanks to everyone for your great questions. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mercy. If you have any words. Thank you, Chayla. We uh, Weatherly, Shannon, Kim, thanks so much for sharing um, your insights and experiences. And to all our attendees, thanks for joining us. Uh, we will post a recording of this webinar online, and that will include uh, some resource links, the ones already shared, and then others that our panelists um, wanted to share with you. And I'll notify you by email when that's uh, available. So this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks all to everyone. So great to connect with you.